I'm recording. All right. So, Andrea, are you the chairman? Uh, unless if you want, go ahead. No, okay. Let, let's, uh, it's your turn. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. We're um, very glad to have uh, Carlo Mendegelli for this week. And uh, thanks, Carlo, for um, participating in the Journal Club. He made the slides especially to adapt to the online format. So we're very grateful. And uh, uh, go ahead. Carlo will talk about uh, bootstrap in a house BPS line defect in n equals 4 Ethereum. Okay, <clears throat> thanks a lot for coming to the online seminar and for the letting me speak here. And uh, so this is journal club. This is a kind of a standard seminar, but the style is journal club. So please ask questions uh, to keep it uh, alive. And um, yes, so the th three quarter of this talk will be work based on work that appeared in 2018 with uh, Pedro Liendo and Vladimir Mitev. Uh, and uh, the last quarter will be work in progress with uh, Fernando Aldai, Pietro Ferrero, which I think is so is, uh, is listening, so he can also intervene if I say something wrong, and Pedro Liendo. Uh, but let me, uh, yes. So the general philosophy that we'll be using this talk is that we might be able to, we want and might be able to solve quantum field theories just by using symmetries and basic assumptions and self consistency conditions. Uh, this is very hard in general, but uh, it appears that it might, uh, might work uh, for an important family of quantum field theories, which are conformal field theories. Uh, why, why conformal field theories? There are many ways, many reasons why they are interesting. Definitely, one can see that they are almost everywhere. Uh, they describe phase second order phase transition in the real world. They, in a, they of course, are endpoints of normalization group flows in quantum field theories. And they also may describe quantum gravity by the idea CFT. But uh, one of other very appealing properties of, of conformal field theories is that they are actually mathematically well defined. So they, they give rise to well-posed mathematical questions that we may be able to, to answer. Uh, other important thing of conformal field theory is that we can actually make progress. So we know we can do many things and we can obtain results. And uh, what are the sort of questions uh, that we are, are asking? So there are two sorts of uh, questions which are, of course, related to one another. One is to derive universal properties on conformal field theories. So something that is, let's say, theory independent of, um, are about exploring the, the space of conformal field theories in D dimensions. And the other question is to study specific theories. So we'll also, also in this talk, there will be this sort of uh, two type of questions. One is universal properties and the other is study specific theories. Uh, I think uh, more than half of the people listening to this talk are like among conformal field theories, super conformal field theories. Uh, in that case, usually we have a lot of extra structure that uh, allow us to be uh, us to be much more ambitious concerning what we want to solve for. And for example, uh, kind of the queen of uh, conformal field theories is n equal for super in uh, in four dimensions. Okay. Uh, to this general CFT, today I will focus on what are called defect CFT. So uh, I just quote a Greg Moore, um, Greg Moore saying that if you have a theory without defect, this is, is defective. So every theory should have defects. Uh, and in this talk today, I will study essentially one of the simplest of all non-trivial defects, which is a one-dimensional line in an equal force pyramid. So it's a one dimensional line carrying a lot of supersymmetry. Uh, somehow the belief is that this is kind of the simplest non-trivial toy model when one would really push a lot of the technology to study conformal field theory. Uh, so like, this is a one, one plus one dimensional line? Or will, will, will really be one. There will be only time. Uh, yeah, there will be really one dimension. Really. Only time? If you wish, only time, yes. I see. So, yeah, uh, what, so this is some kind of brain, secretly? 
uh, well, in, uh, in, in, in the Yamis description is really going to be a whistle line. But in uh, ADS? In, in ADS will be, will be uh, what you're saying. So we have, we will have some string configuration ending on the whistle line uh, on, uh, on the boundary. Can you just tell us what it is? What's the brain? I don't think it's a brain. It's just, uh, it's just uh, the, the fundamental string. Uh, that it ends. What? I mean, the dual of the Maldacena Wilson line, I thought is just uh, the fundamental string ending on the on the Wilson line in question on the boundary. I think it's different the, to, uh, okay. to what Char Char Charlotte and uh, others mm -hmm. were considering, right? Because it's actually an N equals four, just an observable N equals four, rather than a new theory. Right, you, you're thinking of a, of a string that's ending on the on the, yeah, on the Wilson. Yeah. Yes. Okay. But it's possible that there are more. Uh, I think I think uh, there is some there, regime where where uh, yeah. it is described by by a brain, right? Like these papers by Gomez and Passerini. Mm -hmm. e, uh, yes, it's possible. Even though I think it's probably. Uh, you know, one of okay. Let's not go there. But, uh, could be if you do a one over an expansion. But let's. Yeah, it's probably a different regime. I agree. The fundamental is a different, is, is a different more, regime. Is the more interesting. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but I will say a few more words later about. Okay, so the plan is um, to review a few basics of CFT and defect CFT that I will use. Uh, then talk a little bit more about this RPPS line, what are the symmetry, what are the operator we, we can talk about there. And then, uh, so the, for this bit, which is going to be abstract, is not going to make any reference to Wilson lines, just the symmetry of the problem. Next, I will I will review what do we know about Wilson lines in equal four. And then I will approach this problem using the modern numerical bootstrap. And then, uh, ex uh, the same problem using analytically analytic perturbative bootstrap. And when I say old, I mean results from 2018. And then when I say new, I mean results from the last few months uh, that will make contact with a recent paper of Collier. Uh, and uh, I guess they are two students, right? Julius and, uh, okay, anyway, and two students of Collier. Samara. Yes, and David, thanks. Okay, so what are CFT basics? So here I, I mentioned before that CFTs are mathematically well defined. And how does it work? So you start with some data called CFT data. The first datum is, is so called spectrum. So the space of local operators in the theory organize the representations of the conformal group and of whatever other uh, group or super, super symmetry you have in the game. And uh, this label alpha i, which includes the, the conformal dimension and probably the spin, uh, labels superconformal primaries. Okay, so we have the spectrum. And then we have the OP coefficients, which given three such three operators in the spectrum spit out a number, or actually more in general, a bunch of number if these operators are non scalar. And these OP coefficients enter, as the name suggests, the OP. So, if you take the product of two operators, two uh, super conformer, super conformer primaries, uh, we can, in a correlator, we can replace their product, which is a, some sort of bilinear in the operators, to something which is linear in the operator, where, uh, CI, where the sum runs only over super conformal or conformal primaries. C, K, I, J are these OP coefficients, and this curly F which depends on the representation label of the three operators on the distance between the two points on the left and x as derivative on OK. These curly f are, kin are completely kinematically uh, determined quantities. Okay, so the c are you could call dynamical quantities, but the f, the curly f are uh, are kinematically determined. And what is remarkable is that actually this 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 uh, this wiggle here uh, is convergent. So we can replace product of operators by things linear in the operators. And this is actually as a quite a big radius of convergence. And the radius of convergence depends on where the other operators in the correlator are, are situated. Okay. 
but what this means, it means that you can always, this, this, if you're thinking of conformal field theory, you can replace, you can always compute, you can reduce an endpoint function to a lower and lower point function after going to the uh, three point function, uh, which is fixed up to the OP coefficients by, by conformal symmetry. So with this data, you can, in principle, uh, reconstruct completely the, the correlation function in the CFT. But not all, OP, all, uh, not all CFT data, or not all bunch of these numbers, spectrum and OP coefficients, are consist correspond to consistent CFTs. And in fact, uh, it's pretty obvious that you have to require that if you want to compute a four-point function and you do it by applying OP into different ways, the answer should be the same, which uh, is essentially the associativity of this product. And, uh, and this is a very powerful constraint. Let me just remark that if you apply, uh, you take this four-point function of IOJ, OKOL, you apply OP, OI with OJ, and OK with OL, and uh, a very simple algebra with the OP written above, you, you find that uh, this, uh, all the space-time dependence is, is encoded in this CB, the conformal blocks, whose schematic forming is given down there on the right. Okay. What is remarkable is that the unitarity, sorry, and uh, so we have associativity, which is some sort of co completely algebraic uh, relation, but uh, if the CFT is unitary, we have also some positivity constraint on these OP coefficients. So this is uh, the review of CFT basics. What happens, so you can uh, do something to the CFT, namely adding some conformal defects. And the first thing that will happen is that uh, the presence of the defects will break the conformal symmetry down to what? Down to the conformal, so the conformal symmetry of the, of the mother of the, of, the, of the theory in question is the conformal group SO2, D, which are in D dimensions, these space time dimensions. And it's gonna be broken, if you add a P dimensional defect, this symmetry is gonna be broken to the conformal symmetry on the defects with which is a so two comma p times the uh, the trans the rotation in this in the space uh, transverse to the defect this uh, this uh, red so d minus p okay so we have this breaking but uh, the one of the important things when you add the defect is that you have to add extra CFT data so we are adding more structure to this and also more consistency conditions to the CFT. And there are two types of data. So one part of data is the data of a CFT, living, of the CFT living on the defect, which is, I put a star there that I will explain in a second, but essentially we could ignore that we are living on a defect. We could ignore the bulk and just start, live on the defect and there is a CFT there. Uh, with a star that I will explain. But we also have new OP coefficient for the expansion of operator in the bulk in terms of operator on the defect, the so-called bulk boundary OP. Sorry, could I ask about the unitary? So if uh, the mother yes. or father theory yes. was uni yes. uni unitary, the yes. defect uh, CFT, when will it be unitary? Is that well, we, we, have to, we, have to, we have to add, uh, so two things. So uh, first of all, it's not totally obvious what are the, um, so first of all, you, you definitely want this part A to have the unitarity condition of a CFT, okay? But it's not so obvious what are the, uh, of course you could imagine, a, definitely you could imagine adding some, non putting some non-unitary defect in a unitary theory. That is something that is conceivable. And moreover, it's not totally clear uh, what are the unitarity condition on this couple system so that everything is unitary. And in fact, that's why the numerical bootstrap, well, uh, that's a bit pushed. Um, I would say in general, it's true that you can add a non-unitary defect to a unitary theory, okay. Um, oh, but it's somehow about uh, unitary or non-unitary representations of this SO2 comma P times yes, S yes. minus P subgroup, yeah? So yeah, I mean, the representation have to be unitary, of, in, the, in, the, in the definition of unitary, of course, which is relevant here. Unitary or... Uh, ah, okay, it is, it is Lorentz. So it, it should be just unitary, and that's, that's all, no? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. But, but of course, you know, it's not sufficient that the spectrum 
correspond to unitary representation, you also want the opaque coefficients to satisfy some positivity condition. So it's not only about unitarity is not only about the spectrum, otherwise it would be too easy. It's about also the opaque coefficients being this having this positivity positive properties. But definitely the spectrum should be one of should be unitary representations of the conformal algebra and uh, plus condition positivity condition on the OPs. Okay. I don't know if I already so and B yeah is this new CFT data. Uh, and the remark here is that the, the CFT living on the defect is not quite a CFT. Uh, first of all, because it does not include a stress tensor in the spectrum, so there is no stress tensor on the defect. And but we know something about this theory that it contains a special operator called the displacement operator, uh, which is associated to the breaking of the translation invariance by the presence of the defect. And uh, for a general p-dimensional defect is a, is a SOD minus p vector uh, of conformal dimension p plus one. So remember, I, so I will talk for a while in the next of, in the remaining of the talk about this displacement operator. Uh, and in the rest of the talk, I will only focus on type A. So essentially I will live on the defects and not be able to talk to the bulk. I mean, I will not know, I will not consider the, the interplay between bulk and defect. Uh, sorry, Carlo, the CFT on the yes. defect, uh, it doesn't have to have a stress tensor or it, it, you know that it cannot have one? I think it, the thing is it doesn't have a conserved stress tensor. There is no operator which doesn't have one. So, sorry about the displacement operator. So uh, yes, one the displacement operator. Yes. If, if you have one dimensional uh, defect, uh, then yes. What the displacement is a d minus p. So in n equal four, yeah. So if you in the in the in the line defect, in n equal four. I mean, it's really, rotation really, yeah. around the line. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, but really, really think about the field strength. So if you have a line, Wilson line, and you wiggle the Wilson line, it's the same as inserting a field strength, mm. right? Uh, and the field strength is uh, as the definite dimension two delta is equal to p plus one for the line is two, and is a SOD minus P vector, which is four minus one, which is SO3, because, um, well, in principle, you have, of course, uh, the field strength in 4D is, is a three comma Z, one plus one comma three, but then you take some uh, diagonal combination. Anyway, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the whistle line, it's just the field strength, it's just some component of the field strength. But then uh, you still have translation along the line, right? Uh, so why this yeah, doesn't but, give you but something not, like but, stress because energy? It's not, well, this is um, so, uh, it's, okay, well, it's still it's still it's still the big. I think it's still there is still the stress tensor in the bulk. Okay, there is still the stress tensor in the bulk. Of course, it's not it's not. Uh, uh, vanished. I mean, it's still there as an operator. Okay, so that was going to actually follow up with the question there. So yeah, there is a stress tensor in the bulk, but presumably in the presence of the defect, the bulk stress tensor isn't conserved on the defect on its own. Yes, and I would exactly. imagine yes, that you would exactly. have to add some uh, operator from the defect CFT so that the yes. overall stress tensor is conserved. Very, very good. Well. And, is, and is the displacement? And is uh, essentially the displacement operator? Uh, uh huh. Okay. Yes. Uh, so can can I also ask about uh, this relation between boundary and defect operator? So is it, is it because they realize uh, different uh, representations? Yeah. So um, scalar product between such <coughs> states, how is defined? So to, to speak mm -hmm. about unitarity, we need to. Uh, yes. It is about a scalar product between. Yes. 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 So, and, uh, so yes. I understand how what is scalar product between two bulk operators between two boundary operators because it, it yes. is from the same class of representation. But yes, what what about bulk and boundary? What 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 is it, what is it? Yeah, that's a good. So the bulk boundary to. So you should think more about. But this is an important point, of course. Your so, uh, it's a similar question to how do you think that about three point functions? So three point functions in the bulk. Uh, are the when you have the, the, the setup with a with a defect, 
three point function in the bulk have the parallel, which is the two point function of a bulk and a boundary operator, which are exactly the CFT data that I'm mentioning in B. Okay. So they are not like scalar product, they are more like three point function. Okay. Uh, so it's like OP coefficients are like structure constant for an algebra. And then there is this uh, new structure, which is captured by the two point function of a bulk operator and a boundary operator, which as you say, is not a scalar product, but it's still some interesting OP coefficients. And somehow, I mean, very... And what a unitarity tells you about these objects which are not scalar products. So how unitarity works uh, for this um, thing? It's a good, it's a, it's a good question. Um, well, uh, I never studied in detail how this works, but I suppose um, you do the the analog of what you you do to to show that uh, square of OP coefficients are positive. Um, but in practice, but, you, but that's I think, the only yes. thing you will be using, right? That uh, square of uh, OP coefficients so, is positive. That's all you need. Yes, yeah. yes. I what I'm, what uh, yes, that's right. So because I will focus on A, but if I had to focus on B, condition of unitarity are a bit more uh, subtle. B means uh, you include some OP coefficients between the back and the boundary. Uh, can, can I to, today? I will not. I will not talk about B. Okay, can I uh, say something, for, for example, like I decompose uh, one representation over, uh, over, bond, over bulk representations, for example, such type of Klebsch-Gordon decomposition, not Klebsch-Gordon, sorry, such well, type uh, of... Yeah, it's not so simple. So it's the same question. When you do, consider this analogy. When you do OPEs, the OP is not a tensor product. It is, well, you know better maybe <laughs> what is OP, but... Uh, mm -hmm. You cannot determine what is in the right hand side of the OP. You cannot determine the dimension of the operators in OP just by group theory. You know they allow that they have to have some, yeah, they have some, some range in the real, but you cannot say if I have operator of dimension two in the left, I will have operator of dimension four plus n in the right. It's not like that. And similar for for the bike boundary OP. So it's it's not just like the composition of representation, otherwise it would be a bit mm -hmm. trivial. In the same way as OP is not just a tensor product. Of course, you can determine what is on the right hand side of OPs by group theory, but without knowing the allowed, without knowing the actual value of delta on the right, just by pure group theory. Mm -hmm. I hope this remark is clear. But yes, concerning B, really should think about B as the analog of OP coefficients in the bike. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting problem, but uh, this talk is just forgetting about B. In the from the next slide on. Okay. Uh, yes. So I will just dive in uh, something that I think people in this audience are familiar with, but that's why it's good to, to see because it's good to see things we know. So let's remember the, the, the superconformal symmetry of superconformal algebra of n equal four in four dimensions. So we have a conformal algebra which in for this is two comma two. We have an SU four R symmetry. And then you have 16, sorry, 32 fermionic generators. So four times four plus four times four, which is already the four comma four and four bar comma four bar of this bosonic subalgebra. And this is PSC24, one of our favorite superalgebras. And when you add the defect, as I say, we had a one dimensional defect. Uh, we break the conformal symmetry S22 to the conformal symmetry on the defect, which is the SL2. And then you have SU2, which are the transverse rotation the SO3 that rotates the, the three other directions in four dimensions. And then uh, we break also uh, SUR, uh, SU4 to SP4, so I said, which is in, maybe it's more intuitive to understand in SO6 notation, so we break SO6 to SO5. And then we also uh, keep all the ALF, so it's an ALF BPS setup, so we break ALF, we, we, we keep all the ALF of the supersymmetry generators, as the, this little f, as this notation suggests, yeah, they are in the two, in the two-dimensional representation of the force SL2, two-dimensional representation of the SU2, and in the four of SP4. And this forms the superalgebra of SP4 star slash four, where star is just 
a real form of uh, of SO4, which is the one which is SL2 plus SU2. Okay, um, and is useful, and what is what you do all the time to split uh, the 16 fermionic generators F into the one with positive and negative conformal dimensions, and we have this standard Poincare supercharges and special conformal supercharges Q and S. Okay, so alpha goes from one to two is a is a in, is a SU two index of the transverse rotations. So uh, N four is the four of SP four. This is the symmetry. Now let's discuss uh, quickly a few multiplets. So the first is the super dis displacement super multiplets that will be denoted as curly D one. So it starts with uh, five operators in the five of SO5 of dimension one, which are scalar under the transverse spin. In the gauge theory realization, these are just five out of the six real scalars of n equal four. In fact, that's why you have dimension one. And then you actually the supersymmetry and you get uh, fermions, which are four times two, eight. And then you act again and you get the actual, what we actually call the displacement operator, which is the top component or bottom, depends how you turn the multiplet. Um, of the, the super displacement operator. And you can convince yourself that these this operators, the one of dimension one and the fermions and the field strength, are all associated to symmetries that are broken by the presence of the defects. So the fact that you have five scalars uh, reflects the fact that, of dimension one, reflects the fact that the S6 group, which has dimension 15, is broken to SP4, which has dimension 10, and so five are the are the leftover broken symmetry. Uh, similarly for the fermions and for the field strength, for the this actual displacement operator that I just described. Uh, okay, so this is one multiplet. And uh, in the following, I will use a, a bunch more. So one is the obvious generalization of this one, where you, uh, and this, the short decay are the only alt VPS operators in, in this, uh, of this super algebra. Um, and they start off with an operator of dimension k for some integer k, and then are in the representation 0k of SO5, which is the symmetric traceless, a bit like the analog of trace of z to the k in n equal force pre uh, So there are alpha plus operators, and then uh, if you have with q as many times as we can, we, we go for, we range the dimension range from k to delta. To, from delta equal k to delta plus two, but uh, a generic a generic long operator which is which is labeled by a dimension delta and the representation of sp four will actually go to delta plus four because we have <coughs> we have uh, eight q's each of dimension half, so we can act with all of them if we want to if it's a long operator and we get the structure. So uh, all this was mainly to introduce this notation curly half. Curly L A B delta. Uh, all the operators that we discuss today have zero transverse spin, or at least a superconformal primary has zero transverse spin, so they are singlet under the SU2, uh, which was uh, here in there on the left. Um, and finally, there are the semi short operators, uh, which are uh, you, so you see that long operator have this uh, unitarity bound, delta is bigger than 1 plus A plus B. Um, and when a plus when the, when delta hit the unitarity bound, usually uh, the representation become uh, um, reducible, and you have some short operator sub representations. Um, this looks exotic, but is not. And when later I will talk about the gauge theory example, let me uh, let me take the opportunity to describe. An example of a longer unitarity bind. Okay, so but to summarize this table, there are the short decay operator and there are the long operators, and then there are the semi-short, which are a bit exotic. Um, please just look at a second at remark two, and take for simplicity a and b being zero. So we have an operator, a long operator, when delta goes to one, which is in the singlet of SO5, it's gonna be in a semi-short, which is in the two comma zero of SO5. So could you just remind us, you've said it already, but subscript a comma b in square yeah, brackets? Sorry, okay, yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks. So uh, these are uh, dinky label of SP4. 
I, I was a bit fast with that, yeah. The inkey label of SP4, maybe I didn't even say it. So the inkey label of SP4 and the five, the convention that the five is the zero one and the four is the one zero. The spinner is the one zero and the vector is the zero one. So, and so zero in the, is the, right. In the, for example, this, this field F uh, on the yes. right hand side, uh, that's a, a, some sort of auxiliary field. What is that in the? It's a singlet. So, uh, so in the H theory, you yeah. should really think about this uh, phi, psi, and f as really the fundamental fields of n equal four rest living on the line. So they are not gauge invariant operators, but when they are on the line, they can become gauge invariant because they end on, on the on the Wilson line. Uh, so f is what the field strength. F is if it, it is really the field strength. Is really the field strength. Phi is really okay. five of the scalars. And if I q, I can, yes. And yes, so uh, okay, so it's convenient. I will be fast on it, but I think it's an important part of the story which shouldn't be underestimated. It is convenient to describe. So, we, what we want to do, we want to describe correlation functions involving uh, those sort of operators and impose all the constraints we can from the conformal symmetry. And it's very convenient to introduce a uh, uh, a, a ad hoc superspace to describe such correlation functions. And this superspace, which is convenient here, is an ex so if you don't have supersymmetry, you just have t, which is the, the time on the line, if you wish, that is one dimensional story. But now I will supplement t with, uh, so alpha beta goes from, epsilon is just the anti-symmetric tensor in two indices, alpha beta goes from one to two, a b goes also from one to two, and y are bosonic variables are three bosonic variables because uh, why, why is this is symmetric in two variables and then there are these thetas notice that there is no theta bar just theta which are two times two four so this is a super space so I, I package things in a matrix x which is four times four but it's like graded anti-symmetric if you wish so it's a four by four matrix with uh, one plus three bosonic components and four fermionic components now, and why, why, why have any physical meaning? Yes, yeah, so um, why is, uh, uh, if you wish, is a auxiliary variable to contract the index of the five uh, uh, scalar, okay? But uh, as you see why, you see a y, which is three components, so A, looks a like, is, yeah. is five dimensional, sorry. A, a, sorry, a, a and B goes from one to two. One to two. So how so do I control? Why is strict? Why is strict? Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's likely uh, requires a few steps to see how it controls. So how do you get, the question is how to get from five, uh, five, five. So from five components of phi with a Y. So you have to think about phi as being a polynomial in Y. Okay, of degree two subject to some condition. So we'll have phi times y to the zero, which is one scalar, plus y times phi, which is the other three scalar, plus y square in the singlet times the, th the uh, fifth component. So make a super field uh, made out of phi. And so the phi is gonna be, there will be a super field phi, which is a function of x subject to some constraint. But uh, uh, if you're familiar with embedding space for the conformal algebra, uh, is, so when you have an S so n symmetry, use an n vector uh, to make it linearly linear, but then you may want to impose that is vector squared to zero and identify the vector up to scaling to go from d to d minus two so sorry to go from n to n minus two and this is exactly what you're doing here you're going from you have, you have a representation of s of five you are going from five to three by by taking a six a five dimensional vector imposing the squares to zero and then identify it to scale i didn't want to explain too much the, the precise derivation of i mean meaning and role of this uh, wise but it is nothing it is a, it's a sta it's a pretty standard thing um, okay, so we have this, and the action of S before star slash four is uh, uh, on this matrix is just essentially the analog of the SL2 Mobius transformation that acts on tau on T uh, 
as conformal transformation generalized to the old matrix X. And uh, in this uh, superspace, for example, two point function of alpha VPS operator look as simple as they could. So they are just super Pfaffian of the distance of the points, which if the fermions are turned to zero, so if you put theta to zero, are just uh, uh, determinant of y12 divided by t square 12. So y is a two by two matrix, so we can take its determinant. Uh, but it's, it, sh it shows this super space shows its power when you when you consider four point functions, and you can prove without too much work that uh, four point functions of these alpha PS operators, up to a conformal prefactor, which is this one two three l three four two three l, they are functions of the eigenvalues called chi zeta one zeta two of this funny mat this funny four by four matrix. X12, X13 inverse, X34, X24 inverse. And when the fermions are zero, chi is just the standard one dimensional cross ratio T12, T34, T13, T4. Okay. And it's not that hard to convince yourself that uh, this four point function here is uh, super conformal, is OSP4 star slash 4 invariant. Okay. Uh, and you could imagine, I'm done. Uh, I've solved the constraints of superconformal symmetry. This is a structure of a four-point function. But if you think one more second, you say, no, you're, I'm not done because um, it's not true in general. For any, it's not true that given a function a, this uh, uh, the the, for, the correlation function will be a polynomial in y. So we want, in the end of the day, we, we are interested in finding a dimensional representation of SO5, of course. And to ensure that we need to impose some analyticity constraint on AL concerning their dependence on the variable Ys. Okay. And this is so called super you can derive by imposing that uh, uh, there is no super space uh, uh, pole, uh, there is no pole in the Y variables. So there is a polynomial dependence in the Y variables. You can prove that the, the object that contains the information about the four point function, which is this curly A, satisfy these beautiful equations. Okay, so let's look at them. So here it's saying that if you take the derivative with respect to zeta one of A and, and you add half the derivative with respect to chi and set zeta one is equal to chi, you get zero. And the same if you change zeta one with zeta two. So, Maybe I was a bit quick in that. So zeta one and zeta two should be taught as conformal cross ratios made of the y's, okay? So you have four y's, so four, yeah, four y's, and the, conf the group SO5 acts on them, and you can build two cross ratio, which are essentially zeta one, zeta two. Sorry, I missed. Uh, yes. Why do you have three eigenvalues? You that is a good question, of course. And the reason is that uh, the matrix uh, X12, X13 inverse X34, X24 is not a generic matrix because X starts its life as a uh, graded anti symmetric matrix. So if you, if you, but the thing is that if you set the fermion, imagine that you set the theta to zero. If you set the fermions to zero in X, you see that. Uh, you have just a product of a 1D of, you know, the epsilon tensor. Uh, if you see the theta to zero and you do the operation here, X1 to X1, three. So, so I can the out of four. Exactly, yeah, yeah, that's the short answer. Up to the the sign. Sign. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Okay. That's the short yeah. answer, yes. Doing a very Uh Yes. Okay, but this is actually, this equation is very powerful and, uh, for example, implies that if you set the zeta coordinates, the cross ratio for the R symmetry to be equal to chi, the correlator is a function, is, is a constant. You see, it doesn't have to be a constant in principle because it just could be a function of chi, but no, it's just a number, a constant. And this uh, is related to the fact that uh, uh, this problem, this 1D problem with OSP4 slash 4 symmetry, possess a topological subsector. That so I will talk about again. Uh, sorry, thanks. So, chi is the values of this matrix is just the if the fermions are zero, it's just the cross ratio on the line. So, t12, t12 is t1 minus t2. T1 and the zetas are the cross ratios in y. 
exactly these are the cross sections in y so, okay. yeah thanks uh, so actually let me also make a bit so the turning on the theta is just a trick to derive the these equations but once you have derived the equation you can forget about the, the thetas and just work with the bosons with a y and, uh, and t for example so, so the state, like, sorry the, to understand the statement uh, is that if you have what three three point could it, is it three points? It's four points. No, it is right? a four point. It's a four point. Yeah. It's four a four, four point, point correlation of some very particular type of operator, then what it yes. doesn't depend on uh, cross ratio. So this this part is saying if you align the essentially this I know this no. State. So you relate uh, four point correlators at different points is that in, in, in the initial language, right? So uh, if you so this region is, is you can that, change locations, but you also have to tune the operators. So then exactly, exactly. That's right. That's right. Yes. And these are, let me mention since you asked. So this is the same trick that one used to derive a chiral algebra from n equal two theories, for example, by uh, where you don't get constant, but you get uh, a function of only one complex variables. But this was just a side remark. Uh, there is a anyway. There is a whole. Um, Example where you can have this topological, not, not necessarily topological, these these subsectors that can be defined in various setups that can be defined in a similar way. But now for the super displacement operator, uh, one can find a very simple parameterization of the general solution to this equation. And uh, in the end of the day, this curly A is just uh, characterized by giving a number, which is this little a and a function which is this f of chi. So the all of the correlation function of these very many operators is just captured by a number which is a and a function which is f of chi. And and this is and there is some dif simple differential operator d here that produces a. Similar expression exists for curly a, but we'll have more functions depending on the on the weight. L1, L2, L3, L4. Uh, from the very same superconformal worded identities. So the equation, the first equation here with the, is usually called superconformal worded identity. And uh, from them you also, everybody not, not only hold for the full performing function, but they will hold block by block, superconformal block by superconformal block. And this is very useful to derive the superconformal block and to derive the OP rules, which for example, for the displacement of the So you have, uh, the P of two displacement operator can contain the identity operator, just operator with dimension two. Not like E1 is phi, it's just phi square, then some short operator and long operator of which are in the singlet of uh, um, of SO5. Uh, once again, this equation here is saying that. A very just a single function of chi and a constant contains the information about many many operators for example if you want to know the four point function or field strength of this displacement operator is enough to know the four point function of the phi's moreover the four point function of the phi operator will have various asymmetric channel but they are going to all be related by supersymmetry because there's just one function of chi so this is pretty powerful and of course without doing this this work the bootstrap analysis i will talk about later is not going to be possible Okay, so now let's the question so far because now it's slightly. Uh, so just to recap, why do you impose mm. the first equation in the gray box? I missed why why you impose. So this first equation is is a consequence of harmonic anal ar superspace analyticity. So this 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 thing here is formally superconformal invariant, but the field the superfield D that depends on X satisfies some constraint. It's not a generic function of y for sure because we want to find the dimensional representation of SO5 in the end. So might have must have only um, a few components in y. And in particular, this four-point function has to be polynomial in y of a certain degree. And this uh, from this uh, requirement, you can derive this first equation in the box. So it's, it's a consequence of superspace analyticity. Okay. But in the end of the day, is a consequence of supersymmetry, which uh, in this setup is uh, is implemented, as I say. 
Okay, now let's go back to the wish. Uh, very naive question. Um, mm -hmm. How can it be? Uh, why is there no um, no stress tensor? Um, I mean, don't you still have translation invariance along the line? Yes. Yeah, so this is uh, from the. Yeah. I think that definitely you have that, and I think it's just implemented by. Uh, you know, there will be a charge coming from the bike stress tensor, but it's not, so it's the stress tensor in the bike. There is no second stress tensor in the boundary that implements that, you know. The translation is definitely a symmetry, and I imagine that uh, uh, can be, there is an actual operator from which you can define a charge whose action is that translation, which is just the bulk stress tensor. So is that correct that like uh, normal in CFT you have like kind of local uh, symmetry, uh, just uh, stress tensor and uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, just, uh, yeah, that's, so that's not as local... powerful as usually. Oh, yeah, this is, the standard local symmetry that you're referring is to is is correct, uh, of course. But delivery. There are two issues. So one is there are two issues. One is the general issue about having a defect, and the other issue is about having a line. So if you have a line, there is not even a local stress tensor at all you know when you have a line situation is a bit funny but forget the line in general for defects i think that uh, the translation along the defect is implemented by the bulk stress tensor uh, i don't know if i'm saying something wrong i thought that also because this is a non-local theory right because it's always so local. yeah exactly it's non-local that's correct uh-huh uh -huh. so i think what, what, mm -hmm. Uh, sorry, no, uh, uh, I don't know if, some, if I'm saying something wrong. I mean, because here we are referring to the, to the absence of the stress tensor in the mm -hmm. one-dimensional CFT. I think this is the question. So, I think there are two slightly different questions. So one is that in 1D, having a stress tensor is always a funny issue. And the other issue is for, higher, for a defect of dimension bigger than one, there is still a statement that there is no stress tensor on the defects. So there are two slightly different. So, you know, but one thing is that 1D essentially, 1D systems should always be imagined as some sort of uh, uh, thing embedded in a bigger theory, in a bigger space like this, as you will see in the ADS setup. So the 1D is the boundary of some ADS2. Uh, or in n equal 4 is, is, is a whistle line. But I would not say for the wish, for the case of the line, the situation is even clearer. You will not have local operator implementing the symmetries on the defects. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, okay, so we'll so let's recall Wilson line. So this is the RTPS Wilson line. So what is the standard bit of a Wilson line? And then um, there is an extra term which uh, couples the line to the scalars if you want with that unit vector and uh, but remember of course that we have two parameters here one is the representation that we take to take trace and the other is uh, uh, the choice of loop of, of path um, but of course since we have n equal four superior means we can choose freely a gauge group and a value of the coupling if you wish complexify it of coupling so we have parameters if you wish in this example the line is parameterized by a choice of gauge group, a choice of coupling, choice of R, but concerning gamma, I will restrict to line or a circle, and we can always, of course, rotate theta to 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 be along the six component. And here we see very well how the SO six is broken down to SO five because you have this one direction. And now, finally, how would this define SO one DCFT? Well, we can do, for example, object like so. Where you insert operator, and which in principle are not gauge invariant, and then we put the whistle line in between, or we could even imagine inserting the gauge invariant operators in the line. And uh, the what is remarkable is that certain CFT data can be computed exactly using localization. So the first result, which was uh, it's been a, a great success of. Of supersymmetry, of supersymmetry and localization is the calculation of the circular whistle loop in equal four. Uh, and this is the expression. There is no mystery here, it's just integration over the Lie algebra of the gauge group with a quotient factor, and then you take trace over the representation error, this simple thing. 
And then for SQ2, for example, you can do it by yourself. Uh, I think can do it if you, if you remember uh, to include the other. So this is just essentially a square dA. Uh, yeah, I mean, you have the, I mean, you have a measure here. And, and then you get this number for uh, G S U two in the fundamental representation, but you can similarly do this integral without much trouble for anything. And uh, what is uh, remarkable is that you can actually extract from this the endpoint function of displacement operator uh, specialized to the uh, to the topological configuration where chi where zeta one is the analog of zeta one equals zeta two is equal to chi, and this is just given by the nth derivative of the eighth BPS Wilson line. And I should recall that the Wilson line, which is a which uh, with expectation value, which is a modification of this guy for a slightly different path. Uh, uh, this expectation value depends only, is, is related in a simple way to expectation value of the circle by just replacing the gauge coupling, the yeah, mean coupling with this function of the area, where the area is, uh, is some. We lost Carlo. You're muted, Colin. Hi. Uh, it's only Carlo. It looks like uh, yeah, he's coming. Yeah, I think so. One down. Oh, man. <laughs> All right. <laughs> At least he froze in a nice pose. All right, why is the speaker is uh, frozen? Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> what packet did you receive? <laughs> I, well, I received um, <laughs> three sixty liters uh, worth uh, of CO two balloon. CO two. Yeah, CO two. For the sparkling water. Uh, <laughs> okay. Does Carlo know he's frozen? <laughs> In any way to reanimate uh, Carlo? <laughs> <laughs> Send him a message. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we remember him. I, I wrote him on uh, Skype, but um, he's dead. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Just a great choice of words. Yeah, yeah. Literally. <laughs> he's back. Okay, yeah, sorry. So my, my son disconnected. Uh, the <laughs> 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 unplugged the router. Okay, so. <laughs> you unplugged. Uh, <laughs> okay, sorry, but it was it was a good it was a good break. Uh, I mean, a good moment too. Uh, let me <laughs> up also. He unplugged the arrows. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah, it's a good point to have a, have a break. It was a good break. So I did basically. So I just reviewed uh, the symmetry of the problem, a bunch of representations, and the alpha PS field so line equal four. And now we'll like to study this system using modern numerical booster. So and actually, we, we, we normally yes. have a, a break in between a coffee yes. break. Should we okay. have five, 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 seven maybe minutes of coffee break? No? Yeah, coffee that would break. be useful. Yeah, I see. yeah it's fine. All right. See you, what, in six past 11. Okay.
So should we start or? How many? Uh, yes. Didn't we say five? Can, can you finish in like half? How much do you need? Yeah, uh, I was going to ask the same. Hour. Yeah, so uh, 15 is a bit uh, small, but I think definitely less than half an hour. I would say 20. Okay, yeah, yeah. that's great. Yeah, 20 I, minutes I, I, would I, be great. Yeah, I will try with 20. Okay, I will try 20. 10 plus 10, I think it's already, yeah, order 20. <laughs> By the way, Carla, can I ask about mm -hmm. this yes. one-dimensional operators? So when you, uh, the labels of one-dimensional operators are clear from uh, representations, etc. but uh, practically yes. you, you build them from four-dimensional fields. So it is not just kinematical it, restriction, it is, it is more. Yes, yes it's in the example of which lines, yes. If, for example, you integrate some local operators with some weight, I don't know, a long line, something like this. I think it's even more, I have to say, more simple-minded than that. Just in this theory, just think about this this expression here. You just literally put phi there or the strength there as O1, ON, or phi square. You know, it's... It is just, just the local fields restricted to this position. Uh, this is our example, yes. Uh, Exactly, but it's important to remember that, of course, O I O one here is not gauge invariant. So O one, in the end of the day, makes give right to a gauge invariant operator. But yeah, for a, for every phi you bring down, a, you you have a Wilson line that's so there's a phi that's exactly yeah yeah is attached at the, attached at the end line. of the Wilson line or somewhere on the Wilson it, line or something. Exactly, exactly, yeah. I mean, yeah, exactly, yes. Yeah. So phi is a different point on this line, are connected by a line. Yeah, and they can. Uh, I mean, I think it's always instructive to do this calculation for a three level in gauge mm -hmm. theory, so you will see. I, I will uh, later give the answer, but if you take four, or one, or if you take the four point function of phi, maybe with an index A, go from one of the five scalars. Uh, even though actually at three level, you have some sort of funny situation where SO6 is still still looks preserved mm -hmm. but uh, but you have four but yes, you have you can, you four uh, wilson lines and four of yeah but uh, that's right but uh, that's correct but uh, in living order the wilson line are just you can replace them with mm -hmm. one but they will still uh play a role to there is still a trace so there is uh, you have an ordering and uh, the mm -hmm. fact they are on the line it, but yeah in a second i will give an example so because, for example, in light ray case, uh, we built some operators which also very, very similar to this one. It is mm -hmm. two fields and a joint Wilson line between them, but also there was some yes. integration with some weight along, yes. uh, along light yes. ray. Yes. And it was important to have a diagonalization of a dilatation operator, for example. Mm -hmm. If you just put uh, this uh, operator with two fixed position, well, I don't know, this uh, four po position for these insertions, it will not mm -hmm. generalize dilatation and you should uh, actually in integrate with some weight. But here, yes, you, yes, yes. Yeah. But here you have just fixed position, you don't have... Uh, you know, yes, this is, this is simple, yes, yes. But I think you, the thing you are describing is, first of all, your line is gonna is a light cone direction, if I remember correctly. Yes, yes, light, light ray. At least a light ray, so here it's just you know, uh, a, re a time like the, a real direction. Uh, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. it's not a. But for example, I think it's pretty the, different. But will it be this, this uh, operator, this insertion, this no local operator? Will it be uh, eigen function of dilatation operator for this non-local operators? Yeah, yes, yes. I will. I will show later. Will uh, be. Wow. I mean, of course, they have. They have, trans they have very simple transformation properties under the conform under the unbroken conformal group. So, uh, okay. Should I start? Okay. Yes. Let's start. Okay. So now, uh, switch kind of gear and go to more than numerical bootstrap and then some analytic results. 
Of course, in the modern numerical bootstrap, I will essentially make almost no assumptions at all, just unitary. So first of all, I will focus on type A, so, so ignore the existence of the bulk and just leave on the line. I will just leave on the line, but just so assume unitarity on the line, symmetry, which is this OSP for star slash four, and the existence of the operator D1, which should be there if this line is embedded in a bigger theory because it's the disp super displacement operator. So uh, yes, so in this example, crossing symmetry tell us that uh, these two form functions are the same. We can exchange point two and four. Uh, uh, crossing symmetry on the line works a bit differently because uh, operators are naturally ordered. But here uh, we are doing something legal. We are just looking at the line. You know, if you, if you look at this ordering, uh, if you have a line like that and you look at the line on the other side, one ordering is mapped to the other ordering. I, you, can, you can see that. If you have a line like this, or is it just from this side? Um, Anyway, this gives you, and I remind before that uh, the four, this four point function is captured by a single function and a constant, this little f, and crossing symmetry impl implies this very simple re functional relation, if you wish, for, for the four point function f. It's cyclic rotation and inversion, right? What you've done. Exactly, yes, yes. Yeah, exactly, yes, exactly. Cyclic rotation is obvious, but the inversion is just looking at the line. Yes, that's correct. Uh, so, and f. Is a four point function, so it means a conformal block decomposition. But these G are known functions, the, the analog of what I called curly F in the second slide or so. So there is G identity, the contribution of the identity operator, GD2, the contribution of the D2 operator, and G delta, the contribution of the long operator of dimension delta. Uh, C square one, one, Sorry, two are positive. Like, uh, so some defects can have an orientation, but where that where that won't be the same. You're just saying you're assuming unoriented defects. I, I think I'm assuming is a good. Uh, I think that I'm assuming oh. that, but from the point of view of the, if they are defects in in this 4D theory, I I don't I don't see how, how this thing could be broken. Um, is there any subtle sort of defect considered 2D theory? Sorry, is okay. there any subtlety if you consider 2D theory? 2D instead of 1D? No, uh, 1D defect in 2D theory. Exactly, yes, that's, I think, is the, that's, I think is the question, yes. Well, there are all defects. So you can have a defect and an anti defect, but then the ordering is important. So it's okay, it's just. Yeah, I think it's. Uh, um, the shot I was remarking and not IRD. Um, but yes, well, if, 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 uh, operator, about... if your operator is okay, some derivative, right? Then, well, but then it's just a sign, I guess. Um, it was just a comment. Uh, no... Yeah, it is a good comment. Yeah. I, was just saying, I was just trying to think if n equal four there is room for such things. But um, okay. okay, so there is this conformal block decomposition. So what we don't know in, in general is s, this curly s, which is the values of delta we are summing over the spectrum, or at least the part of the spectrum which is relevant for this four point function. And we don't know the positive numbers c squared one, one, two, and c squared delta. Okay, and as I say, uh, unitarity implies that delta is bigger than one, but also that this c squared are positive and lambda squared is positive. Uh, c squared one one two could be well, this is a bit of a stupid notation because c squared one two could be also zero, but lambda squared delta is only positive, otherwise, we wouldn't put, even put it there in the spectrum. Okay, uh, the thing is that there is a region of values of chi which actually is pretty big where both. OP's expansion on the left and on the right are convergent, and these allow us to write the crossing equation like so, where is, I hope it's pretty clear what is happening from, from here to here, just plug in the conformal block expansion and define this F star function for each representation exchange. And now we're left with this equation. To 
remove some mystery, this known function are very simple. So GID is just chi, GD2 is just this combination, this chi multiplied by hyper geometric and similar G delta. So these are very simple fu known functions. And these are the equations we are going to fight with numerically in a second. So let me report it here. So the question, the question is. Before you uh, go to, to the next transparency, yes. show the previous one. Uh, still, yes. uh, maybe I didn't understand uh, well. Uh, so all your operators are on the line. So the crossing yes. have a completely different meaning. Can you elaborate on it? Because to me, these are just two different functions. So is a, is a, is a good one. So. Um, different correlation functions. I mean. Okay, so if you were not on the line, you would agree with me that these are the same correlation of function. Course, of course. Okay, so here I think is because, uh, as I say, if you have a line, if you look at the line, so first of all, the cyclic symmetry on the line mm -hmm. uh, is a symmetry. The line well, is, uh, line is uh, map line to the circle to make it a bit easier. So, yeah, I mean, I compactify well, to so a circle. You do the conformal transformation to the circle. Yes. Then you can yes. rotate them, but it's still yes. not the same. Yeah. Well, it's, it's literally because they are identical operators. Uh, in, the, in the Wilson line in n equal four is obvious because in the Wilson line you can just. No, okay, but move. the arguments are differently ordered. That's the most important. Yeah, then you can use uh, yeah, yeah, but minus you... t symmetry, just flip the space. Ah, you can also, you have some sort of parity or whatever. Yeah, there is a parity in the n equals four, so it should yes. be. Yeah, you, it does it give enough of information? It's strange to me because in four dimensions you have uh, the, the bootstrap. Indeed, it based is based on the fact that it is the same function. But here, yes. it's it is also the same function. Yeah, after these symmetries are applied. Okay, I yes, understand. yes, Thank yes. You. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So we thank you. So we start with this, this is the question we have. We know the f, we want to know curly s and the square, c square and lambda square. Uh, this is hard. So the reason why, one of the reasons why it is, is hard to solve this equation, apart from the fact we, we don't know what we are summing over, which is one of the things that makes it very hard. The other reason why it is hard is that there are so many solutions that it's hard to solve because there are too many solutions probably. But one thing that uh, numeric, the idea of the numerical bootstrap the zero order idea is to rule out candidate spectra. So imagine that I found find a linear functional called alpha, I will say something in a second, which space of functional will be looked at. So linear functional alpha, so that so it's linear and this can be swapped with the sum, infinite sum. And uh, so you apply the functional alpha to this equation and imagine that you find a functional so with this property. is one on the identity block, and this zero on the show is positive on all the rest, where delta is restricted to the guest spectrum. If you find such functional, of course, you cannot solve this equation because for, with positive c squared and lambda squared, because you have one plus positive equals zero. So there is no way to solve it. So what is a functional? Well, um, what is a function? So the vector space in question here is, the, is some sort of function of chi, it's the vector space, the functionality is the dual vector space, and uh, this is a very complicated infinite dimensional space, but we can truncate it in a simple way by just saying, look, I just take the function f of chi, I take it and derivative, I, I evaluate it at chi's half, and I take linear combinations of the first lambda derivatives. And this is a finite dimensional space of functionals. And I can search uh, this space. I can search for, given a spectrum, I can search for a functional with this property, okay? So this is a way to rule out candidate spectra. Uh, but there is, one can also do other things about OP coefficient. For example, find lower and upper bounds on the OP coefficient. This is an example. I may, maybe since time is limited, I will not explain too much what is happening, but is uh, if you normalize alpha with this way, plus or minus one, and it's positive on those, uh, and you try to maximize the value of alpha on the identity, it's easy to see that this implies that uh, C squared is smaller than the for the plus sign, and bigger than this value for the minus sign, a simple exercise. But the up, 
the messages that one can also put bound on OP coefficients in this way. Okay, now what are the simplest thing one does is to take the four point function of the one operators and play with uh, the value of delta zero zero. So you delta zero zero is the dimension of the operator with smallest dimension in the OP. So you have this sum. Uh, zero, zero because it's a scalar of s to five, and we want to know what is the maximum allowed value for the smallest dimension operator in this OP. Okay, there's a sum here, you take the smallest delta in this sum, and you want to make it as big as you can, and it cannot get too big. So, the, the upshot is that by this analysis, so here in the left plot, we are taking lambda larger and larger, so we are searching a functional space bigger and bigger. So, if lambda is infinity, we are going to get the optimal uh, answer or the best answer we can in this way. So lambda to infinity, and we see that if you increase lambda, the maximum avowed value of delta zero zero tends to two. Same Why there the first, several lines? I think it was plot with if including or excluding the first few, uh, you know, the, the, the small values of lambda. I don't know. I mean, yeah, but it's, I think it's pretty clear that it's, it's going to do. And the second one is just uh, the gap uh, between uh, the smallest dimension operator in the OP and the next one. And you see that that gap is, uh, is gonna, so these dots here are bigger and bigger values of lambda. So it's com the allowed region is the, is the pinkish one. Or I don't know which color is that. There's the allowed region here below, and you see that the allowed region is gonna say that the gap, if you, if you have, is essentially around two, cannot be much bigger, and it varies in this way. Okay. The next, for considering OP coefficients. So, sorry, yes. the conclusion is what? That the maximal delta you can allow for is two. Is two, yes. And is, in fact, as you, probably already know is the strength th is the value uh, mm -hmm. of a well-known theory which is the strength theory of strong coupling mm -hmm. the very strong coupling limit of strength theory saturates the bound so it's <laughs> monoton monotonically grow in other words i mean not monotonic but it can't like jump above two and then go back to two yeah, yeah exactly but you will see now in a second what happens so uh, this is the plot of op coefficient so this is the allowed region for square op coefficient and uh, delta zero zero allowed value of delta zero zero. The square root coefficient in n equals one, this Wilson line can be computed analytically thanks to uh, localization. And I will show an, another plot in a, few, in a few minutes. So we have C1, so this is the allowed region. This point here, the two two, is exactly the strong coupling point. Okay. And this can be computed in string theory, of course. Um, and uh, as I will show below, planar n equal four at weak coupling is this point. And there is a question. Wait, what's the computation in string theory? Yeah, the string theory was uh, done by uh, John B. Roybal and Cycling. And uh, essentially, you take string you, you take uh, fluctuations around uh, the the configuration that gives you the circular whistle line or the, or the straight whistle line. You take fluctuation and then the fluctuations are identified immediately with the, with the five scalars uh, and uh, the eight fermions and the three. Well, the fermions are even right because you don't need for that. But there is fluctuation are identified with the displacement operator component, super displacement operator. But I will go back to that. This is an important part of, of the talk. And then here I was just, uh, so it's, but the thing I want you to remember is that uh, this lower bound here is not, uh, planar n equal four. Planar equal four is somewhere here, and I will show it in a bit. Uh, and in fact, this uh, this yellow line, the existence of this yellow line, sorry, this this red line, uh, is can be easily explained by the existence of a simple so four point function, which is this one. Uh, where engaged theory, as which coupling engaged theory is it the value of psi. But psi can go uh, formally. You can keep unitarity by pushing psi to minus one, where c squared one, one, two is zero, which is this point. But for the planar theory, this number is zero, so psi is one. Sorry, sorry. In the planar theory, uh, 
uh, xi is zero. Um, but uh, one important thing is that there is no choice of gauge group and representation of the whistle line that allow you to go to this region here. And as I say, uh, what is this? Yeah, okay, maybe let me not go now in the analytic prediction. Okay, but this is the, uh, space, the allowed space. Uh, this, do we also consider the, the, D, the D1, D2 mixed? Yes? Is there any theory that leaves at the position of the cusp? Because I see the yeah. cusp in this figure. Yeah, we, we are gonna, um, I will ask this question again in a second, but uh, the answer is, uh, open is an open question if uh, so if, yeah is that cusp you mean uh, the left or the right to the left right right one this, this corner no, 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 the, the other this, one yeah that one yeah. This, this this point is uh, is strong coupling string theory lambda to infinity and to infinity this point Sorry, is that one infinity. is the red point right is the, this red point yes but that is not precisely at the at the cusp. I oh, know the cusp is just a so. Uh, this is the allowed region, and if you increase the, the numerical search, you are gonna lower and lower a little bit the bound, the, the line above and the line below, so that in the end of the day, the cusp will end exactly on the red dot. Mm -hmm. It's just an, we are doing. We are just saying what is the allowed region. So what we are actually saying what is the unallowed region. So outside of what I paint is not allowed, but would shrink a little bit more if you increase the numerics. So yeah, the cusp is the theory uh, we discussed. So the extra bit is not is not meaningful. Okay. Uh, now we can do some mixed correlator. So, but sorry, I can, I can I now yeah. ask about the other one? Yeah, yeah, the other one is yes, please. Yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, the, the other one is. Uh, so there is an obvious solution to crossing, which is the one I've right here, the one, the one, the one with the parameter xi, and you can uh, formally put xi to minus one, keeping uh, this correlation function unitary, satisfying all the unitarity in this correlation function. Uh, that's why so, this so line. So just non, non interacting scalar, right? Delta is one and. So Very good. Yes. L L L actually, looks more like a fair. Well, I don't know if I should call it fermion or boson. Maybe it's more like a fermion. Uh, because the square is zero, and if you look at the statistics, when it's, so if size is minus one, you see that if you exchange point one and two, you get a minus sign. Sorry, you get not even that because one two is similar. Yeah, I don't know. It is a funny, but I will go back to this question in a second. Let me skip this uh, uh, this picture because probably it's technical to explain. Let me just go to this C one one two C two two allowed region, which I think points to, to the question we are both asking, which is the following. So the right hand side, the right hand side is all the allowed values of this space of couple of three point function C222 and C112, where C222 is the three point function of three short operator type D2. And the allowed space is the, is the blue one. And this is co done by computing using localization for several uh, for several choice of gauge group and for several representations and varying the coupling. So we cannot go beyond that. But uh, the numerical bootstrap suggests that the region of allowed solution to crossing is actually much bigger. And we're still not clear uh, how to interpret the region, which is not this blue one. So all the rest, could it be that is not a good uh, defect in n equal four? We don't know, but of course the natural question is, uh, if there is an interpretation for all the rest, which is not uh, blue. I mean, similarly to here, what is not- uh, Sorry, could, yeah. could you tell what is two? So one is what is this uh, phi, oh, that's phi A, phi A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two, two, two is, you think about two as phi square. And one, one what was one then? Phi was the phi scalar. And ah, two the, is the, the, the phi one which is, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, and the two is the five scalar, but squared in a symmetrized traceless. Okay, I'm going very slow, so let me just uh, go to the analytic part. But the upshot of the numeric is that, okay, there is this, I think this plot is interesting, but is this point on the right, which we're gonna study in a second and show again, and then that there is more 
uh, of this 1D setup, then Wilson lines. And the question is if the analysis is different than equal four, or there is some condition we are not taking into account. Um, so let me go to the numeric, to the analytics very quickly. So we just, I wrote again, the crossing equation and the conformal block decomposition. And the theory, the red dot in the previous slide just correspond to a free theory where F0 has this very simple form, zero because it's the unperturbed theory we're gonna perturb momentarily. The, the opico, this is the short OP coefficient here. This is the spectrum, just delta is two, four, six, eight, which you think about five, uh, derivative square derivative to the power times phi these numbers these operators and then this are the coefficient here and now we can imagine perturbing this solution and when you perturb you what do you do you are going to take this expansion the conformal block decomposition and expand what the OP coefficient a and a delta of the OP coefficient will be expanded in a small parameter as well as uh, the dimension delta here and the dimension is well known and it's easy to convince yourself looking at the expression of the blocks that uh, the expansion of the of the dimension will produce logarithm of chi okay something that in the small chi expansion has a logarithm of chi and this multiplies the anomalous dimension you think i put in red and then the rest is some all the rest that I write like that but this all the rest is the property that once expanded at small chi is a as a regular expansion at small chi, is chi to the power, integer powers. Okay, but the red is the coefficient of the log, so it's well defined. But now we have a crossing symmetry, which is the equation here, which tell us that uh, uh, if there is error of chi log chi by crossing symmetry, there must be also this term. And there can be in general another term, which is the property of being crossing symmetric as regular at chi and chi equal one. Okay, so this is very general, the perturbation of this simple solution. And now we look at the transformation, to make progress, we look at the transformation of individual blocks under this uh, map, which is the analog of exchanging point one and two. So we look how the block transform, we can do that, of course. And by that, it's not hard to derive the following equation for the function little r and little q. I remind you that little r and little q are the thing that parameterize uh, the first order perturbation of the four point function, where little r of chi knows about the, the anomalous dimensions. And you see, you can derive these equations. So they have two types of transformation. One is uh, chi to one minus chi, like here. And like, uh, well, here this remixing, and then q to this relation. And what you find is that if you assume that our chi and q of chi are rational, and you further assume that gamma delta doesn't grow too fast for large delta, the anomalous dimension, then you find that rq and q chi are uniquely fixed by the above, and you can find the CFT data. And this is exactly reproduce the string theory calculation of John B. Seidlin in, I would say, a few very, very with very little effort. Okay, uh, Carlo. Yes. Can, can, can I ask you to 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 talk a bit more about how how you come to the um, not growing too fast um, yes. assumption? Because we need to make this this same tool? one. Um, These two, yes. So uh, I think from string theory, you will know that uh, uh, the answer has to take this form, where R and Q are rational. Yeah. I think this you know. So the rationality of R and Q is uh, is not an issue. It's not an issue. Yeah. It's, it's okay. It's a simple assumption if you assume string theory in the description. The fact that gamma, de so, but it's also clear that even if they are rational, you will have too many solutions. Mm. I mean, there are in fact infinitely many solutions, but uh, the fact that you don't want delta gamma of delta to grow too fast with delta, well, is a. Uh, there are various ways to make it a bit more more precise, various arguments. It is perturbation theory, so it's a bit hard to, to make arguments like regular limit uh, or solid and so on, but we are going to use this uh, growth of delta ga gamma of delta as a criterion. All right. the time. So, uh, I think it's reasonable that you don't want gamma delta to grow too fast with delta. Otherwise, essentially, yeah, I think it's, it's, a, it's a reasonable uh, assumption. Let me just show, you can go farther and go to, we can do actually much farther. You can, for example, go to second order 
And the second order, you do a similar game. You also include Li2, but then they don't appear in the answer. And you get, uh, you, you can find ABC as rational function in a similar to the method even before. And you find, for example, that gamma, the second order, the normal dimension are, are given by those uh, formula. And there's a reasonable agreement with the numerical bootstrap. But uh, when we so wrote the paper, delta, we talk, yes, delta is integer. Is it like? A, yeah, it's, it's a funny. Yeah, it's, it's a funny notation. Yeah, it's the initial condition. So delta is integer two, four, six, eight, uh, uh, even integer. But at the time, we thought this result was not coincide with uh, with string theory. So we just put it there, some sort of as a, if you wish. Well, it's an interesting solution to perturbative solution. But we thought this is not going to coincide with string theory. And the reason, which seems subtle but is crucial, is that um, the coefficient of log square at next order, if you expand the conformal block decomposition, is given by the square of the first order anomalous dimension multiplied by zero order of p coefficient. But uh, in general, if there is degeneracy, you don't know the square of the anomalous dimension from the first order because these two quantities are in general different. If you think for two seconds, you will see that uh, there can be operators which are degenerate at, uh, at zeroth order. And if the degeneracy of dimension get lifted at first order, these two quantities are not gonna be equal. So we thought that solution here was just, some, was, not, was not string theory solution. But then the paper of uh, Collier, David and Julius came out and we saw that actually this number is the number they had. And in fact, they did much better and they did more orders in exactly and then some other numerically. And now let's go back to the previous plot. And here, I, thanks to the data that uh, the authors uh, gave me, I just plotted here uh, their numerical calculation for the numerous dimension that they did with the quantum spectral curve. And you see how it fits in the line. And you, what do you see, which is interesting is that and the way why you can do it because you know you know C1 and two exactly actually all the way. I write right away the perturbative expansion, but you see that the the red dots follow the lower bound for quite a while before departing from one state. Of course, uh, there is more in here. For example, an equal force pair means with the gauge group S U2 will be somewhere here. If you're very long. Okay, so uh but now let me just finish saying a few things of what uh, what is really new? What can we do better? So, uh, what is the systematic approach for this analytic perturbation? So, but so uh, we know, yes. Then, then you recycle this perturbative data into the structure constant, right? So that the forty-five eight is new. Right? What we get? Uh, forty-five eight, forty-five eight. No, that's for c squared on the next line. Ah yes yes no no but this is very this thing is very this is uh it's just a derivative it's just obtained from derivative of the which ah okay this is real, okay this is a very simple this, this, yeah this is an auto order yes of course our our bootstrap approach doesn't know what uh, lambda is does know only what that's why in this plot there is only c one one two square and delta because we parameterize everything in terms of c one and two. Uh, so we can, so now what are we going to do? So we know the free CFT, but be aware it's not generalized free theory. So the free CFT are going to perturb. We know all the correlation functions there. And the, the, the idea is that at a given order in perturbation theory, we know all the log, all the higher log term up to the linear log and the non log term in the most chi expansion. We know them all because we have, if we did a good job, in the previous orders, we are able, to, we know the CFT, enough CFT data to extract all these functions, which is good. And uh, to make progress, we need a good space of function of, chi, of the variable chi. And the way you proceed, you argue that uh, the function of chi have increasing transcendentality degree at each order. So at a given order, the maximal transcendentality degree is given by the order. And then each order is a finite basis of such function up to rational function of chi. And in fact, up to fourth order, only logs Li2, Li3, Li4 with various arguments are sufficient. So there is this good space of function. Then one bootstrap a large enough system of correlators imposes before the delta to infinity grows in a certain way at large delta, add input from topological sector and the, the 
the, the message that the solution is unique. The solution for the for all correlation function at a given order is unique given this input, which is pretty remarkable. So you don't have to do any calculation. Well, any any direct calculation. Uh, so this is time is really I'm really going out of time. This is a table just scaring you about how many superconformal primaries are there that you can build in the free theory. So they grow extremely fast. Uh, but somehow, so the mixing look hopeless, but actually there is some uh, uh, hierarchy of operators, so you don't have to, um, to consider them all at, at the beginning. But one other uh, interesting about this table is that if you look at operators, for example, where uh, delta, if these numbers are 0k, for example, 0 to here, uh, the operator in this diagonal are non-degenerate. And this is an input which is very useful. And actually, it would be nice to, to compute the anomalous dimension of those operators with the quantum spectral curve of these operators in here. Uh, and let me also show you some preliminary remarks, so, uh, which also explain why we had agreement with the, with the paper of Collier. And, and is that we found that actually, at first order, the degeneracies are not lifted. And all the anomalous dimension at first order, or at least for many of the operators we looked at, are just given by the Casimir of OSP4 slash 4, which is this expression. So for any operator O, at first order, its anomalous dimension depends only on his representation and not of the detail of the operators, because we have many operators with a given representation. And it takes this, this simple form. We also were able to show that at second order, uh, the, the degeneracies are lifted. For example, there are two operators. Uh, with delta equal four and their dimension uh, satisfy these equations, so yeah, these two solutions. And this actually explain uh, why we are, if you run the, uh, you explain why we could agree with this paper for gamma two and gamma three, and we were able to reproduce gamma three as well. We are still working on on the fourth order, which for which there is only a numerical prediction for now, but I'm, I'm confident that in a couple of days, uh, the result for this will come out. I mean, from the boot. Uh, let me quickly summarize. So you already uh, numerically so is already agrees with uh, Julius and company, right? So this is sorry, sorry. This is your number. Ah, it's my number. Okay. This is your number. Uh, we are not. What we are going to do is going to be exact. Uh, the only what I was saying here is that at fourth order, you really have you need really to solve with uh, with good confidence the mixing problem at second order. You see that second order is mixing. A second order will affect fourth order. You have to to look carefully at how the order works, but you will see that. So we have to first solve mixing at at second order like we did here for delta equal four. And then feed it into the bootstrap and uh, and get this number. Okay, so let me just uh, summarize a few things. So one open question is how to interpret the no Wilson line allowed region in the plot. So there are unitarity seems to allow for more uh, defects, even even though of course it's not clear that the extra allowed parameter space correspond to actual defect, but they are definitely not Wilson line. Maybe one need to uh, ex add extra consistency condition for coupling with the bulk. Then there was a interesting uh, interplay between integrability, localization, and bootstrap. And I think this one, this CFT, is really uh, one of the simplest non-trivial CFT one could imagine solving exactly, at least uh, in the planar n equal four. So uh, for any value of the coupling. And this is a bit different from uh, uh, the bulk case where somehow. The planar, the planar n equal four is not a good CFT. It's not quite a good CFT. But here, the planar theory is a good CFT, is a good one, the CFT. So there is some more to be done, but in our structure. You mean because no, no double trace mixing because there is only ex one trace. Yeah, exactly, the, but the double trace, of course, are there. You cannot just throw them in the trash. I mean, you, there is no four-point function without double trace. In fact, they dominate at large n. Uh, yeah. Um, and then, okay, one could uh, maybe do some more sophisticated key, uh, analysis using the analytic functional. Um, 
and maybe do some higher point for like multiple bootstrap and of course a similar methods to higher dimensional defects, even though I would insist that this 1D problem is, uh, is one one can do a lot of progress and understand uh, things in many details. Okay, thank you, sorry for going over time. Thanks, we can all unmute and uh, thank Carlo. Can you turn me out, otherwise we can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Carlo, so, can I ask a question? <laughs> yep. Uh, yes. So about your analytic bootstrap. So normally, mm -hmm. like a, uh, the stuff that you mentioned doesn't work if there is degeneracy. But here yes, you are yes. saying that there is a degeneracy, but because yes. the OP data doesn't depend on the details of the operator, that's why. It works. Uh, I, I said that there is there is degeneracy. But mm -hmm. it's lifted at second order, not at first order. Usually, the generalist is lifted at first order, but this is, here is lifted at second order. And then, in order to get the second order answer, uh, you consider like a several different four point function in order to uh, ex yeah, exactly, solve yes. that mix, mixing problem. Okay. Exactly. I consider several four point functions. Like one, one, and one, in fact, one, 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 two, two. Actually, much more than that. And, and if you see here, the growth is. is very ugly, even though there is some hierarchy. So you see how many operators are there of dimension 14, which are scalar, 149. Can you actually it's explain really... this table a bit? Because uh, so I understand so, delta, what, what is going down and what is that? So sorry, so these are operators. So uh, I'm taking uh, as let, I have a letter, which is uh, the displacement operator. So I have phi, uh, psi, and f, and it's derivative. So this is the letter, and then I'm making words. So I'm, I'm making all the super conformal primaries made of these letters. And they restrict only to the one with transverse spin zero. And delta and delta and this number zero 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 one, which are A B, are labels for the primary. So it's dimension and it's our symmetry representation. And and here on the right I just count how many are them using standard, I mean this is a, a well defined group theory problem. Organize um, space into representation could be done, can be done very efficiently using characters of OSP4 star slash 4. So and you count and you get big numbers but of course maybe there is a better not all of them will appear. Sorry but what is this notation 08 in the brackets just yeah you yeah, that's the dinking, dinking labels of oh, okay. OSP4. All right. So 0 zero eight is the eight symmetric traceless representation of SO5. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's very useful for us to remember that this so operator it's not, not number of indices, right, essentially. Uh, in that example, the zero of k are just number of indices, yes. And but for us, it's extremely important to use the fact that these operators here are non-degenerate. So several <laughs> correlator, several correlator here will produce some anomalous dimension, but they're going to be the same for all of them. In the other case. Correlator function are just going to produce average anomalous dimensions, and the average depends on the operator on the correlator. Unless there is only one operator being exchanged, and then the average coincides with the value. Of course. Right. So here you counted the number of operators at weak coupling. Yes. No, no, okay. it's strong coupling. It's strong, it's strong, strong coupling, coupling which is much like which, which which is much simpler, of course. Yes. I see. I see. I see. A strong coupling is simpler. Yes. Right, right, I agree. And there are less operators, yes. Right. So another question is like us. Already at two loops, I would expect there will be some new operators appearing in the OPE, like a full particle state. That's a good, uh, uh, this is also a bit of a tricky. So even the four particle state, you know, is already tricky because what do you mean by an operator? Uh, what is an operator? Well, an operator is an eigenvalue, eigenfunction of the of the dilatation operator. Right. But until you diagonal, until you resolve the degeneracy, you cannot say what you mean by an operator because if there are two operators which are degenerate. Uh, okay. Sorry, but but in in that table you are counting for particle operators, right? Yeah, of course. Yes, I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm that I agree. But like I was asking okay. about the details of how to yes, solve. Yes. So analytically. Yeah, uh, so essentially, so uh, of course you are pointing the right direction. So, uh, of course, these 149 operators, 
in at dimension 14 are not gonna all appear at small order in perturbation theory. Some of them will, will probably appear later on. And, but for the moment, we didn't find uh, um, operators, uh, new operators whose OP coefficient were zero at leading God, genuinely new operator whose OP well, coefficient were zero. But genuinely no, I mean, but I would expect, like, already at two loops, there will be a new operator, which is made out of four particle state. The point is that that was already there at, uh, at one loop secretly, because... Uh, oh, really? Uh, because, because, because the operator which was there at one loop was actually in a combination of a phi square with derivative and a phi to the fourth. Mm -hmm. exactly, this, exactly, exactly this here. So how can you explain this? These, uh, these two operators are exactly phi square. Sorry. Um, so the idea would be that the operators like phi derivative uh, square phi is mm -hmm. equivalent to phi four, phi to the fourth, something like that. Uh, the they enter the the, 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 the oh, coefficient enter the same order. The so coefficient starts the same you order. You get linear mean. linear combination of those and uh, yes. and then. Uh, but when you, you take might expect, okay, I see. But in yeah. principle, there might be some like a new linear combination. But, the, but there is more. That there is more. I agree. So, yeah. if you look at the for delta equal four, we are still lucky enough that there are just right. two. So, but for higher delta, the phenomenon you are saying is correct. So, I see. Uh, there will be genuinely new operators, mm -hmm. which will appear. At Actually, can I ask something related? Did you use the symmetry under? like sort of reversal parity in on on the line so to say or time reversal z2 symmetry so this is like a, i think is a reasonable question but i could even imagine that uh, supersymmetry well i don't it's possible that supersymmetry even implies that i didn't thought, but i think um, i think we use it but i would say that supersymmetry is possible that supersymmetry implies it i don't know okay um. So I guess like another simple defect is the defect in SU2 theory because the number mm -hmm. of EPS of protect, like a protected operator is very small also in that case. Yes, yes, yes. Can you imagine trying some analytic bootstrap in that case? Yeah, we kind of thought a little, but uh, gauge, as you know, so gauge theory at weak coupling are harder than uh, so first of all uh, so sorry which theory yes. which uh, defect can you uh, just saying that the, the, the i think short is just taking the wilson line in the fundamental representation for gauge group su2 ah. right for oh, final yeah right yeah for gauge group su2 so uh, this and this the thing is that uh, bps operator uh, uh, are non-degenerate so the, the number of VPS operator is the same as that strong coupling. So there is phi, yeah, phi yeah. square, and so. Uh, but in, in this plot here is somehow starting from I don't I don't remember this number here. Uh, this is not, somewhere here in the plot. This this is the point of weak coupling. Uh, but the, the reason why it's harder is that when you are on the boundary of the allowed region like you are here, the operator that enter are roughly half of the operators that are exchanged in the bulk. So here you have, is uh, it's not so easy to do that. Uh, you have too many operators. So when you move, I think intuitively the reason is that if you perturb here, in a sense you have one, only one, you can move only one di along one direction, but here you are gonna move around. Um, there are too many directions essentially you can for the perturbation so it's hard to do this analytic thing because you have too many solutions when you perturb uh, do you think SUT theory, theory at a self dual coupling sits at some point on the boundary um, well uh, it's a uh, um, it's hard to, uh, what could it be? Actually, uh, let me see. 
let me see if this plot helps us saying something about it. Yes, so this is a true bearing lambda. Sorry, we are reaching Design. the boundary in the time space. Yeah, you're right. So, yeah, anyway, uh, I, I, it's hard to tell, of course. It's hard to okay, tell okay. Uh, All right, whether thanks. that is going to fit. Okay, thanks. All right, so Carlo will update us in yes. a couple of days, and at the moment, let's uh, thank Yeah, yeah, you I, hope, I hope I can update this. <laughs> All right, so thanks everyone for participating. So you can join more people by submitting this form. So we send the link before in the next week. So Andrea may tell about the next speaker. Oh, yeah, next week we have uh, Nat Levin. I don't know if, uh, Nat, if you're online, do you want to say something about your... Yeah, I'm going to talk next week about um about some recent work um, about um, integrable sigma models and RG flow. All right. So thanks everyone. So Saturday next week, same time. Uh, thanks. Bye bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye